Thank you, Priscilla. What a passage. I heard a few amens already. I am so excited that we're digging into the book of Revelation. If you haven't got it in front of you, um, we have Bibles here at the front. Just wave a hand and we can supply a Bible. Um, It really helps to have the text in front of you. Um, I don't know how you felt when you heard that we were doing a church series on Revelation. Maybe some of you were going, brilliant. Maybe some of you have heard that before. There may have been some trepidation. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, um, but it's going to be great. Um, I hope today we're just going to frame the book. Uh, We're going to start digging into it properly um, after that. We're really, we're only going to be in those first eight verses. And even then, there's more that we could talk about than we have time for today. Um, But my own experience with the book of Revelation started when I became a Christian, aged about 14. And I was told, you know, you should read the whole Bible. I thought, great. And somebody did say to me, don't necessarily start at Genesis. Um, And I thought, okay, great. And I started in the Gospels. But I wasn't always accompanied through reading it. And so I didn't really understand Revelation at all. And uh, on top of that, it was the early days of the internet. And some of you will not have any idea what this is, but some of you will have seen web pages that look like this. Wave a hand if you've seen one of these. You know, for those on, on the tape, all sort of comic script and really big kind of blaring headlines of beware the mark of the beast. And, and I would read these things. And of course, I didn't have the you know the the grounding to assess for myself is this really what this passage is about is this trying to teach us about barcodes or whatever it might be and so I would go down these rabbit holes oh yes this is this is what it's all about and um, out of that I became quite wary of this book uh, quite scared of the book actually in some ways and actually I think a lot of people uh, do you want to just black that out again that's going to be really really distracting otherwise. Uh, Actually, I think a lot of people are quite scared of the book of Revelation. And then on top of that, um, Christians, we do love a good controversy, don't we? And we love to to have a little label and say, oh, I'm post-millennialist, or I'm pre-millennialist, or I'm a-millennialist, and we have a good old discussion about which one's right. I'm actually a millennial, uh, but that's just when I was born. We can get caught up in lots and lots of sort of controversies over the minutiae and miss the point of the book. Actually, later on, my experience of the book was I came to start reading the church letters, those first few chapters after chapter one, and they really challenged me. I, for the first time I heard a sermon on the church in Laodicea and not being lukewarm. That really hit me where it hurt. It was, it was such a powerful sermon. And then I started to read the end of the book of Revelation, the scenes of the new Jerusalem, Um, coming down out of heaven from God and the description of how God was going to restore all things and that started to do me good and then I started to dig into some of the middle chapters about the scenes of heavenly worship and you see some amazing things there as well Um, but actually the whole book will do us good and that's where we're going to focus uh, today is what what does this whole book actually want to do for us so if we can um, get the slides back up that would be great Um, Here is what I'm hoping this series will do for us. So each week we'll dig into either a specific passage or sometimes we'll take a theme that comes out over two or three chapters. And obviously there will be specific things out of that particular passage. But overall, I would like these things to come out of the series. I want us to overcome fear and awkwardness around the book of Revelation. It is such a gift to the church. um, And I want us to feel confident in reading it. not to be a source of embarrassment when somebody who doesn't know Jesus says, what about that weird stuff in Revelation? But actually for there to be that confidence that says, this is the word of God, it does us good, and actually I can explain what good it does us. To arrive at useful mysteries, what do I mean by that? There are many, many mysteries, again, particularly on the internet. You know, does the description of the locusts with scorpion tails in, Gen- in Revelation 9 talk about Apache gunships? I don't think that's a useful mystery for us to unpack. Genuine one. Go and look it up. Um, that, that's something that people discuss. But there are really useful mysteries. Like in the scenes of heavenly worship, the lamb at the centre of the throne is the lamb who was slain. In this perfect creation in which there is no suffering and no sickness and no death, at the centre of it, Jesus' wounds are part of his glory. Now that's a useful mystery. 
Okay, so we're going to unpack that. What are the useful mysteries? What are the things that are going to do us good and shape us and take us on in our journey of following Jesus um, over this series? And hopefully along the way, leave to one side things which may or may not be of any value to us, but certainly generate a lot more heat than light. Along the way, we'll then also learn, I hope, if we don't already have this confidence, that we ourselves can dig into Revelation and find goodness for ourselves there. And that is a a really good step of confidence for us to take. We are going to take, I think, 15 weeks off the top of my head over the book of Revelation. It's not enough to go into every point I'd love to go into. But actually, I hope it will give us the vocabulary, the tools that we can go and dig into it ourselves as well in our private reading. Number four, this is probably what we're going to mostly focus on today. I want it to help us grow our understanding of the spiritual realities around us. This book talks about what is going on now in the heavenlies, and it can form what it's like for us when we're at work tomorrow, or looking after the kids on Wednesday, or um, just out for a walk with friends on a Friday. This this informs our daily life because we remember what it says about spiritual realities. And so, number five, it helps us to live more faithful lives of following Jesus or discipleship. So that's my overarching aims for the series. Um, It will come out in lots of different ways. Um, These slides, as always, by the way, will be available for download. So feel free to take a photo if you want, um, Cyril, I spotted you, but but do download them from um, from the website if it's easier. So, what is the book of Revelation about? Open it up. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. We're going to really dig into that first sentence to start with. The first word in Greek, revelation, it's the Greek apocalyptus, uh, which doesn't mean the end of the world. So we use the word apocalypse Uh, synonymously now with catastrophic event, meteorite hitting the earth, nuclear war, whatever it might be. But the Greek means revelation, and it it doesn't mean it in some sort sort of visionary sense so much as taking off a cover, apo, off, calypto, um, is is the cover on something. You take the cover off something, and it's revealed. And this is what this this word revelation means, apocalypse. The French call it l'apocalypse, Um, I think probably some old English translations use the apocalypse of John as well. Um, We use the word revelation, but this is what it's about, the unveiling. And we have in the NIV the revelation from Jesus Christ. Does anyone else have something other than from Jesus Christ? What have you got? Of Jesus Christ. And you've got that as well, Joan. So of is probably grammatically more correct. Um, the, the Greek has the same variations as the English in terms of what it means here. So it's, it's what's called the genitive case, if you're interested. Some of you know what that means. Um, it can mean of in the same sense that the book of Job is about Job. And it can mean of in the same way that the gospel of Matthew is by Matthew. It means both. And that's a clue to the rest of this book. This is a revelation by Jesus and it's a revelation about Jesus. It's Jesus who's being revealed more than anything else. And if we end up too far off down the road of going, it's about events being unveiled, or it's about um, this particular number being unveiled, we've missed the point. This is about Jesus being unveiled. Jesus is explaining to his servants what he is like, what he's about, what he's doing. There's a flashback here, isn't there? Because John has had a revelation of Jesus before now. What was that? Shouted out somebody. It was a very short one. The transfiguration. Thank you, Reuben. So John has seen the covers come off Jesus once before. Okay, Jesus is there being found in human likeness, as Philippian puts it, and yet he goes up the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and the covers come off for a moment. And he shines brighter than the sun and he sees them there talking with Moses and Elijah. And and then the veil comes back down again. And maybe 70, 80 years later on the island of Patmos, he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. And the Lord lifts the cover off again and shows him, this is who I am and what I'm doing in the world. So the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants not just to show John, but to show his servants. This has got something for all of us. 
to show his servants what must soon take place. Now, I don't think we specifically planned it this way, but we have just been in the latter chapters of Matthew, and we've run into this soon before now, haven't we? I'm coming like a thief in the night. The time is near. In fact, actually, it's Jesus' whole message. In Mark, it's right at the very beginning. The kingdom of, uh, kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe. And this has been a, a struggle for Christians throughout the centuries. Of Jesus said he was coming soon, but it's been five centuries now. It's been 10 centuries. Now it's been 2,000 years. Is this soon? And if you remember, in, in the book of Matthew, we were digging into how um, actually we're supposed to always live as though Jesus could come back now. That, that's his intent in, in soon. But actually, more than that, what we'll see as we go on is that he is coming. It's not just that he will come at some determined point in the future, but we don't know when, but he is coming And this comes out through the book of Revelation, perhaps more clearly than anywhere else. The kingdom of God is coming, and in some sense it has come with the first coming of Jesus, and it is coming now, and it will come completely when Jesus returns. This is the space that we're living in. So what that means is that we're not primarily looking at Here's a string of events in the book of Revelation which are going to happen, and when all the things in the book have happened, then Jesus will come back. That, that's not really what it's about. Jesus is coming. Here's what's going on. Yes, there's a few specific events, but really here's what's going on in that time between now and Jesus coming again, and then here's what it's going to be like when he comes again. I wonder if a picture might be more helpful on this one. This is the BMW mini plant down the road. Okay, it's a nice, calm, grey building with a toy mini on the roof and a big poster on the side. And every now and again, a car comes out of it or a truckload of cars comes out of it, shiny new cars. Okay, and this is, from an outsider's point of view, this is what happens. And in fact, if you didn't understand anything about automotive manufacturing, you'd say you have this calm building and every now and again, a car pops out. Okay, but what happens if we apocalypse it? That's what's inside, okay? When you draw back the curtain, you understand what's really going on. Now, in our daily lives, we might think our daily lives, the spiritual realm is a little bit like that grey facade. Like, we, you know, it's, it's all a little bit sort of hidden. And, but actually, what Revelation shows us is this is what is going on in the heavenlies around us. This is what is happening at the moment. And if we want to just sort of extrapolate this a bit further, we've had delays in this supply chain with cars, haven't we? Anyone here ordered a new car and had it delayed? No, we've been spared that. Okay. Oh, yeah, there you are. Okay. Chip manufacturing issues and stuff like that. But you could imagine if you don't understand the inside of a car factory, you put in your order for a new car and you're going, well, one day it's going to come out of the factory. Is it, is it really going to come? I don't know. Like, it's, it's either there or it's not, and it's not there at the moment. Is it going to get... It'll come one day, I'm sure. When will it come? I don't know. And actually, if you pull off the cover of the, of the plant, you can say, well, look, it's coming. This is what's happening as it comes. You know, you may not understand all the processes, but look at all these robot arms whizzing around. Look at the giant paint lab, um, biggest paint space in Europe, I read the other day, um, where they paint these minis and stuff. This, this is what's really going on. And it's, it's the same for us as believers. When we say Jesus is coming back, but when is he coming back? And, and why is it so hard in the meantime? I sat down with some pastors in Albania just a few weeks ago, and one of them, uh, he said to me, I'm, I'm having doubts pastor. They all call you pastor out there. I'm having doubts, pastor. I was like, do I call you pastor back? That's going to sound very <laughs> odd. You're a pastor as well. And, um, and when we dug into it, he wasn't really having doubts. What he was really saying is, it's so hard. I can't feed my family as, you know, as well as I'd like. I've got medical difficulties and we can't afford to pay the bills. It's really hard. And actually, people around me seem to be doing much better and they're not even living for Jesus. So, What's going on? And actually the answer, you know, much as you'd like to be able to give some wonderful you know, answer that incorporated everything, really what it was was keep going. He is coming back. You're doing what he's called you to. He's faithful. That, that's the answer we need. John is writing as a pastor. He's writing to these churches 
some of which he has pastored, probably most of which through the Ephesus church he has some pastoral responsibility for. And part of his message is keep going, guys. He is coming back. Don't be put off by the fact that you've not seen the coming in the clouds moment yet, because he is coming and here is all the stuff that's going on in the background while he comes. So when you see that going on, don't be disturbed. It's a sign that the thing that you're hoping for is really going to happen. And I want to say that's good for us as well today. When you look around you at world events and people say, how can a loving God allow these things to happen? These are all the things that have to happen as the loving God comes into his world. I want you as well, just in this, to hear the tone in which this is offered. John describes himself as the disciple Jesus loved. I don't know how much you long for Jesus to come back. David, was it you earlier who was praying, can we pray, come Lord Jesus? You know, I I read the longing in this book and it reminds me, John knew what it was to share a meal with Jesus. John knew what it was to walk down the road and probably share a joke with Jesus. John knew what it was to be with him, to see him when his friend Lazarus died, to celebrate with him at the wedding in Cana in Galilee. And John has been bereft of that physical presence of Jesus for maybe 70 years. We don't know the age is quite involved. And can you hear the longing in his voice when he says, come, Lord Jesus, come. He is so devoted to Christ and what it must have meant for him, and we're not even going to get there this week, we're going to get there next week, but when he sees this vision of Jesus, he's like, that's the Jesus I saw on the mountain. That longing in him, I want that to infect us as we read this book. This book is supposed to change us. This is the word of God. Let's allow that longing that John has, which Jesus has allowed to be put into this, to shape our longings as well. Like, do we long for Jesus to come back? If not, let's get a bigger idea of who Jesus is and what he's doing, and then we will long for it. So, if it's this lifting off of the covers, if it's showing us what's really going on, then what this is going to be doing for us as a book is giving us a different lens for looking at life. And what I mean by that, I can be a bit abstract sometimes, I know. So here are some lenses that the world uses. I probably wouldn't name it as such most of the time unless you're a sociologist or something, but if you read editorials and newspapers, that's a really good way to see these things coming out. Um, One of them would be this evolutionary one. So it says, you know, humans were the product of microevolution, macroevolution. We're not basically good or evil. We don't have a moral dimension to us. We just exist. And in this existence, through the processes of natural selection, the strong get stronger, the weak get weaker. And what that means is that, generally speaking, evil will win out as long as it's strong enough, except that sometimes there's this kind of social cohesion that's evolutionarily um, productive. And so, you know, you find societies forming, you know, mutual protection and looking after the weak because somehow it's evolutionarily better for them and that might possibly counter it. It's quite a bleak worldview. It's obviously epitomized by the likes of Dawkins, but actually it's quite well, you know, well believed in the world if you really dig into it. That, that's one lens people might look at life through. Another one, I think probably more common actually than that, is that says humans are basically all good, right? We're all, we're all nice people, most of us anyway, um, and we're learning more about the world and we're talking to each other more, we're better connected than ever, Um, We can work together for common good. Science and technology can help us in that. And because of all of that, we will gradually overcome the evils of poverty and war and hunger, and we'll reach this perfect state in which actually all of that is dealt with. And you can see really strong narratives in that as well, and some of the statistics even line up with that. And so you'll see people talk about this as though really all we need to do is just understand each other better, get better at science and tech, and and be nicer to each other, and everything will all be perfect. And that's another lens that people might look at the world through. In the Christian world, we've got another couple that I just want to to pick up on. Um, One particular Christian mindset is that the world is full of evil, there's snares all around us, everything is out to catch you into selling out on your faith, and what we really need to do is just huddle together in church and ride out the storm until Jesus comes back. 
Now, actually, there's some truth in that. I'm not, I'm not saying this is totally wrong at all. There's, there's a lot of truth in that, but it's not the full picture, is it? And you get a different picture that other people will take, which says, I've called it Christian progressive. It says, you know, some of God's goodness in every culture and God loves to redeem and transform human things by bringing his son to the center of them. So what we really need to do is get Christians everywhere in the world, into every area of society, in culture, in government, uh, and, and see those areas transformed and the kingdom of God come. And there's truth in that as well, isn't there? But actually, Revelation gives us some different lenses, which I think are probably more helpful and less polarized than that, because they don't really capture the fullness of what Jesus reveals here. So these are five lenses we're going to look at through the book of Revelation, and they roughly pan out in chronological order as well. So the first one is this, the risen Jesus is in amongst his churches. Jesus is with us. If you want the the simplest version of it, God is with us but not just with us personally, but he's with us in the church. He's with us through people and people together. He's with us in local congregations. Jesus is right amongst his churches. He has things to say to us about not just our own lives, but about our church. He works with us in community. This is one of our lenses. We'll get to that in the letters to the churches. The next one is that the lamb is enthroned in heavenly praise. Not just that he will be one day exalted by everybody, but even now he is worshipped. Even now the lamb that was slain is at the centre of heavenly worship. And when we engage in worship, and you know, I, I think of worship mainly in terms of sung worship, but of course that's not the only form of worship at all. Every time that we sing about Jesus, we are lining up with what is already going on in the heavenlies. But every time at work you make a decision to live for Christ, even though it's costly to you, maybe to your career or maybe to your reputation, or it just means being disciplined about how you respond to somebody. When you live out that life worship, you are lining up with what is going on in the heavenlies. We'll dig into that more in in chapters four and five, but you see these figures around the throne laying down their crowns. Like, What's the crowns that God's put on you? When you lay them at his feet, you're lining up with heavenly worship. That's a good lens for life, isn't it? Um, The third one, there is an epic ongoing spiritual battle going on. When we get into women running away from dragons that spew out rivers from their mouths, you know, that really incredible um, picture language there. It's a picture of the spiritual battle that is going on in the world at the moment. There can be peace across nations and yet an intense spiritual battle going on there. And there can be battle going on on earth in the sort of visible sense of war, and that may not be the epicenter of what's going on spiritually. There is this unseen reality. Remember, keep thinking, covers coming off. What's really going on? Is there really peace here? Or is there a a storm going on in the spiritual realms? A helpful lens for when we think about why things are hard, why particular things are hard, that should, should be easy, but they aren't because they're contested spiritually. The fourth one, there's a just judgment coming. And it's a good thing. We need a just judge. This is a fourth lens, and there's a lot on judgment in the book of Revelation. And it reminds us that however unfair things might seem, that however bleak things might seem, there is a God who cares about justice in heaven, and he is coming back to judge. And when he does, he will bring an end to all of this injustice. We're going to dig into that lens fourth. And then lastly, Jesus brings it all to perfect completion. Those last two are probably what that pastor in Albania most needed to hear. There is justice coming, and when Jesus comes back, he brings a reward with him. Perfect completion for creation. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. As we turn over our life through these lenses, we will be, as Paul puts it in Romans, renewed by the, transformed by the renewing of our minds. So what I would love is for this to be intensely practical for us. I'm, I'm going to set just a, a small challenge at the end of today's talk, but what I would really love would be if you find something that is preached on a Sunday or something you, you read in Revelation as you read your way through, impacting your daily life. You know, I think about this topic differently 
because of something I saw in the passage in Revelation. I would really love if you would be willing to stand up here and just say it for 30 seconds, a minute, just to help other people. You know, I, I have the disadvantage that I've not worked in a real job for 10 years. <laughs> All my stories of the workplace are 10 years old. Um, I would love for you to be sharing. Look, this is how this actually impacts my life, working as a nurse, because there is an ongoing spiritual battle. This is why I find it easier to care for an aging relative when I know that Jesus brings it to a perfect completion, whatever it might be. But just a little snippet of daily life, and I know that a lot of us don't like standing up here and, and talking, but actually there's a real benefit to others, if you will. So I want to ask you, please, if, if you have one of those moments where you clock it and you think, oh, do you know what? That really changes how I see something. Would you please assume that you're the only one and, and just get in touch and say, look, could I share something for 30 seconds? I would love it if we could just have a little bit of that voice of here's how the word of God is changing us. I think that's probably enough framing. We're just going to spend a little bit of time digging into verses four to eight before we finish. And there's a wonderful blessing in verses four to eight. Blessed is this, blessed is this, blessed is this. Um, so we're going to read, with the blessings actually in verse 3, but we're going to read aloud verses 4 to 8. Um, let's stand. If, you, if you're able to, should we stand? And we're going to read this together. Now, this is not just, this is not a gimmick that we're going to read this aloud. And it's not chance that the word says, blessed are those who read, that, read this word aloud. There is something about speaking it out that is much more experiential than having somebody read it to you or reading it on a page. This, this book is meant to be experienced. So let's read this aloud, verses 4 through to 8. Um, we'll start from grace and peace. Grace and peace to you from him who was, is and was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power for ever and ever, Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Have a seat. Do you know we just read blessing for ourselves as well as reading truth? Isn't that a good thing? Just read the word aloud and let it do us good. Um, I just want to pick up just in passing that look, he is coming with the clouds. Probably most of you have got that written out in like poetry in verse form. Um, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. You know when you get a, a wine, it says on the side, you know, best, best, eaten, uh, best um, drunk with particular foods. It has like, almost like a tasting notes. Um, Revelation is best read with other books of the Bible. It, it actually never makes a direct quotation, like word-for-word -word quotation. But there's more quotations in here than I think, in, sort of percentage-wise, than any other book of the Bible, just very slightly adapted. It's like he's absorbed these scriptures, and what comes out is almost word-for-word, -word, but not quite, because he's absorbed it, and it's come out in what he's writing. Um, that there is, is a combination of something from Daniel, this picture of the one, the one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds, and then this every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. There's a prophecy in Zechariah which talks about they will look on the one that they have pierced and they will mourn. John has imbibed these scriptures and it comes out. If, if you are not engaged in a particular reading plan of scripture at the moment and therefore you're not bound to reading certain things, I'd recommend read some Daniel, some, some Zechariah, it will help you in your reading of Revelation, but also read the Gospels, because it's the same Jesus. It's just cover on, cover off. 
Okay, so that will help us to shape our reading of Revelation. Dig into some of those prophetic books. Isaiah would be great as well. Isaiah, Daniel, Zechariah, but the Gospels. And of course, if you read John's Gospel, you see so many common themes coming through anyway. So how does this affect us? This is where I want to leave us for today. And next week, we've got the real face-to-face with Jesus. We've got the vision of the Son of Man, and, and we'll get into that fully. But for today, we've just read, to him who loves us, look, he's coming. And then we've got him saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who was and is and is to come. I always say that in the wrong order, but it means the same. Who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. And the challenge I have for us is like, put those together. Because if you put those three things together, you have a lens for life, don't you? So I'm not going to do the work for you. The next slide has got my version of this. But I want you to take a minute now and think about it. If if I was going to put that into a pithy sentence that I could remember tomorrow and Wednesday and Friday, like what what would that sentence be? Because then what you can do is you can meditate on it throughout the week and allow it to shape how you see the world and how you see life. So have a go now, have a minute, put that together into a pithy sentence of your own, write it down if you have a chance, why not? Um, Let's do that now. Okay, just turn to somebody sitting next to you and just share your version. Um, If you're not sitting next to somebody, Scoot your chair across and share it with somebody sitting next to you. What's your version of that? Did anybody hear one that was so excellent that they want to share what their neighbour came up with? No pressure. Wave a hand if you want to. No, that, that, that's unfair. That's unfair. But, like, remember it. Here's the one I came up with. I'm loved by the one who created everything whose plans and intentions define where everything is headed. That's the omega bit. And he's on his way. I'm going to try and meditate on that throughout this week and allow that to shape me. But you will quite possibly have a better turn of phrase and one that resonates more with you. So take that, but do it. Let's actually do this. This is the word of God. We're taking it into a, a form that we're able to turn over and meditate on in our heads. Let's allow that to transform our lives. I, I know from conversations with you that you know, some of you are going out into weeks that are going to be really, really challenging in all kinds of ways. You know, what does it mean to be loved by the one who really holds everything in his hands in that context? Like we'll get on to some other stuff about what it means to be in a spiritual battle and what it is to have victory in Christ and what it is to reign with him and you know, all of those things. But, but just this week, like what is it to be loved by the one who holds it all? That's quite amazing, isn't it? How's that affect your daily life? I'd love, please, for next week, for there to be one or two people who've got in touch and said, you know what, that has changed how I've seen something this week. And please just drop me an email or a WhatsApp because it would be great for people to be hearing others' voices in this as well. But for now, I'm just going to pray and then I'm going to hand back to Gordon. Um, Lord Jesus... We see you as the servant king in the Gospels. The one who didn't consider equality something to be grasped, but emptied himself. who humbled himself to death on a cross. And we read in Philippians that you are now exalted to the highest place. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And I pray that as we read our way through this book, we would see you, not just the Jesus of the Gospels with your glory veiled, but also the Jesus of Revelation with the covers off. I pray that you would expand our ability to see our daily life through the lens of what you are doing and who you are and your plan to come back. Please would you keep us walking faithfully and in perseverance, knowing that you are coming and you will come. And Jesus, I pray we would bring honour to your name by how we live. Please would you help us to capture some of the great love 
that you have for us and to reflect it back to you. Amen.